Thank you for joining the tour from Utah to Carson City, Nevada Territory. Fish Springs Station. Well, apparently this station was named for the uh, abundant small fish that lived in a warm mineral springs nearby. But all I can say is, when we reached the station, we were glad for the first time that the dictionary was along because we never could have found the language to tell how glad we were. In any sort of dictionary but an unabridged one with pictures in it. But there could not have been found in the whole library of dictionaries language sufficient to tell how tired those mules were after their 23-mile pull. Well, best estimates are the original station was actually east of the monument that was built next to the road. Um, apparently there was a thatched roof shed on the site in 1859, two years before I came through. Today, the station site and areas part of the Fish Springs National Wildlife Refuge administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Many years after I had written of this time in my life, I became aware of the truth of this time. The white man or American had arrived and had disrupted the ecosystem. They had cut down many of the groves of the trees that were such an important food source for the Paiute. They had taken control of the water sources. They had taken control of large areas of grazing land. It was apparently a small spring of very brackish water near Boyd Station. I dug a well to try to improve the water supply, but all that was found was brine so strong they used it to cure meat. It was a poison spring a good distance to the north. Use that to kill coyotes. Well, Boyd Station may have also been known as Butte or Desert Station. It was apparently built around 1855 by George Washington Boyd, but a relative named Bid Boyd lived there until around the turn of the century. According to local resident and Pony Express historian David Bagley, he didn't do much but hang out there and enjoy the solitude. Records state the uh, original cabin was log. But the remains there today are a uh, stone. Well, I don't recall much at all about the two stations they call Willow, Willow Springs or Willow Creek. I guess I was sleeping through this part of the journey. Well, there's apparently a good deal of controversy about uh, Willow Springs. Anyway, the station is on private land, a small ranching community of Kalau. It's a monument next to the road. Apparently, there was a cabin built by one Pete Joyce. He lived at this location in his cabin. And suggests its use as a station house. Well, the winter of 1859-1860 was particularly cold and snowy in the Great Basin, creating great hardship for the Paiute. Approximately 6,000 Paiutes in Nevada suffered during the winter of fierce blizzards that year. By spring, the whole tribe was ready to embark on a war, except for the Paiute chief named Numaga. For three days, Numaga fasted and argued for peace. Well, on the morning of the 16th day out from St. Joseph, we arrived at the entrance of Rocky Canyon, 250 miles from Salt Lake. I believe they now call this canyon Blood Canyon. This is where I 
first encountered the Ghost Shoot Indians. I did not like these people, but at the time I had not traveled much. I had not seen much of the world. But then we all have our flaws, and we all must strive to get past our prejudices. This station was originally built by Howard Egan as an express station. It was a log house with a stable and a dugout used as a kitchen and dining area. Well, in July of 1863, two years after my visit, the station was attacked and burnt down by Indians. I'm informed that five express employees and two soldiers were killed in the attack. It was rebuilt as Round Station because it was a fortified rock structure with gun ports. I'm informed that there were probably three different stations built at this site. The first two burnt down by the Indians. I don't know if I visited the first or the second. News of the 1863 attack must have had something to do with my dislike of those Indians. After many years of reflection, it now occurs to me that they probably resented the white man arriving and confiscating all their property with little, if any, remuneration. Peep Creek Station Noted English traveler Richard Burton described the site as two huts and a station house, a large, respectable-looking building of brick surrounded by fenced fields, watercourses, and stacks of good adobe. He said the station master was uh, Harrison Seaver. Major Howard Egan, the division superintendent of stations from Salt Lake City to Roberts Creek, kept his ranch here. He produced hay, grain, beef, and mutton for the other stations along the route. Prairie Gate Station, or Eight Mile Station, whichever you prefer, is the easternmost station in the state of Nevada. It was apparently brand new when I passed through, built in July of 1861. It was associated with the Pony Express for only a short time, maybe three months. But it uh, was very important to uh, the Overland Stage Company. Well, the exact location of the Prairie Gate, or this eight mile station, is now unknown. In the spring of 1860, a large number of Paiute bands gathered at Pyramid Lake for the spring fish run. This was a larger gathering than usual due to the diminished food supplies throughout the region. Indian leaders, including Winnemucca the Younger, also known as Poito, and Numaga, had been in council pondering what to do about the white encroachment. It is said that Numaga fasted for three days and was the only one arguing for peace. He had actually lived amongst the whites and was aware of just how large their presence was. Now, the Antelope Springs Station, I can't recall if there was any structure there or not, and told the original station to be burnt down on June 1st, 1860. There was a stone horse barn northeast of the Antelope Springs Station. This belonged to the Tippet Land and Livestock Company. It was there they housed the horses switched at the station. The attack on Williams Station is usually reported as the cause for the Paiute War. The station was a saloon, general store, and stagecoach stop located along the Carson River. From a number of accounts of what happened, the men from the Williams Station kidnapped and raped two Paiute girls. A group of Paiutes, possibly a force of Anishinaabe soldiers, attacked the station, forcing the perpetrators into the house and then burning it down. The Indians were said to have dismissed several people who were not responsible for the rapes, 
before firing the house. Rather than travel around the Antelope Range as we went from the Antelope Station to Spring Valley, we decided to go over it. There was no station officially in Spring Valley in 1860 when Sir Richard Burton traveled through there, but the Pony Express and the Overland Mail Company did have a stop somewhere along this creek by the time I traveled through. Constant Duval, or a man named Raynal, possibly served as station keepers. I'm informed that a Pony Express rider, Elijah and Uncle Nick Wilson, was killed by Indians at the Spring Valley Station. This was when he attempted to stop them from stealing horses. He had stopped there for a meal and found two young boys managing operations. Their fate is unknown. When news of the raid at uh, Williams Station came to the attention of the Council of Indians of Pyramid Lake, the new Magas reported to have said, There is no longer any use for council. We must prepare for war. For the soldiers will now come here to fight us. Obviously, this is a paraphrase. It is doubtful the council was being held in the English language. Well, from Spring Valley Station to the Shell Creek Station, we passed over the Shell Creek Range, Shellbourne Pass. Uh, Shell Creek Station was built in 1859 by George Charpening and Howard Egan. Sir Richard Burton visited the site October 5th of 1860 and indicated that one Francois de France, Constant Duval, was a station keeper. It's also noted that the station had been attacked by Indians on June 8th of 1860, possibly killing three people and scattering the station's livestock. One victim, or at least onlooker, from the attack on Williams Station escaped to Virginia City and caused a general panic. A volunteer militia of about 105 men was formed under the command of Major William Ormsby. Accounts indicate that they were poorly armed, badly mounted, and almost completely unorganized. Well, from Shell Creek Station, we crossed Cherry Creek Basin and entered Egan Canyon, north of Cocomongo Mountain, at 8,677 feet, and south of Egan Peak at 7,428 feet. This was a popular ambush site. July 15th or 16th of 1860, uh, Approximately 80 Indians arrived at the station, took station keeper Mike Holden and a Pony Express rider named Wilson as prisoners, helped themselves to food supplies. A rider, William Dennis, en route from Ruby Valley Station to Egan Station, saw the Indians and slipped away before they discovered him. He found Lieutenant Weed and 60 soldiers whom he passed shortly before reaching Egan and returned with them to the station. The soldiers killed about 17 or 18 Indians and freed the two captives. Apparently the surviving Indians, not satisfied with the results, adjourned to Shell Creek Station as mentioned earlier and killed the station master there and two assistants. In October of that same year, Indians returned to the station, killed the men there, and burnt the buildings. According to Sir Richard Burton, when he arrived on October 5th, he found part of a chimney, a few pieces of burned wood, and evidence of partially buried bodies. Sometime later, the 
The station was rebuilt by the Overland Mail Company and continued on in their service until 1869. Ormsby's volunteer militia met at Williams Station, but found no natives there. They headed towards Pyramid Lake and encountered a small party of Paiutes on a rocky hill carrying a white flag, possibly in an attempt to explain the events at the station. The whites attacked the Indians, who fled after returning a few shots. The Indians continued firing sporadically as they fled into the ravine with the militia pursuing them. Once in the ravine, 200 to 300 Paiute warriors appeared and began shooting. They closed off the route of escape and fired on the militia from all sides. The total dead was 76 civilian militia members, including Ormsby, and an unknown number of Paiutes. This was the uh, 17th day and we were passing the highest mountain peaks we had yet seen. And although the day was very warm, the night that followed upon its heels was wintry cold and blankets were next to useless. Well, upon leaving Mountain Springs Station and the Maverick Spring Range, we head into Ruby Valley and across the valley to Ruby Valley Station. The station began in 1859 as part of George Torpenning's mail route. William Uncle Billy Rogers and Frederick William Hurst managed the station operations. Rogers served as station keeper when Richard Burton visited the site on October 7th 1860. At the time Burton visited, it was considered the halfway point between Salt Lake City and the Carson Valley. A band of Shoshone and the Army also established camps near the station at various times. Camp Floyd's Company B of the 4th Artillery Regiment arrived at Ruby Valley in May 1860 to protect the mail route during the Pyramid Lake War and remained there until October. The structures all apparently were moved to uh, the Northeastern Nevada Museum in Elko in 1960. Well, we departed Ruby Valley Station, took Overland Pass through the Ruby Range and on into Huntington Valley en route to Jacobs Well Station. Jacobs Well is noted by many sources as a Pony Express station and did not exist when Richard Burton passed through the area on October 8th of 1860, but it was probably up a short time later or as a part of the Overland Mail Company contract. General Frederick Jacobs and a crew of men dug a well and erected a small stone structure that served as a stop for both the Pony Express riders and the Overland Mail Company. There doesn't seem to be any evidence of the station at the site today, however. Well, we left Jacob's Well, traveled through the Diamond Mountains into Diamond Valley. Following Long Telegraph Canyon, we get to the Diamond Springs Station. Sources generally agree on the identity of Diamond Springs Station the Pony Express station, although for no apparent reason, Maple Loving cites it as Drummond Springs. Must be a typo on his part. Richard Burton visited the station on October 9th, 1860. Noted its Mormon station keepers and the site as a water source. 
According to Burton, the station was named after the warm but sweet and beautifully clear water bubbling up from the earth. Another source mentions that Diamond Springs received its name from Jack Diamond, a miner and prospector. Edna Patterson lists the station keeper as a William Cox during the Pony Express era. Cox remained at Diamond Springs when the Overland Telegraph arrived, served as telegraph operator and maintenance man for stations between Cherry Creek and Roberts Creek, Nevada. A little small town of Diamond City was formed during the mid-1860s as silver discoveries were made in 1864, but Production did not begin until 1866. The primary producer was the Champion Mine. Most of this mining ended in the 1870s. Few people stayed on until 1884 when the town was finally abandoned. Sulphur Springs Station. This station was built in July of 1861 as a overland stage stop. The Pony Express probably used it as well. At Sulphur Springs, which is now fenced in and across the road, there are several types of ruins. There's one remnant of a log wall, several stone foundations, and many pieces of old artifacts. This is possibly the site of the Overland Stage Station. The site's about one to two miles north of the Pony Express Trail and about two miles south of the Sulphur Springs Ranch, which has been since renamed to the Diamond Star Ranch. This private land owned by one John Trowbridge. Roberts Creek Station is at the southern end of the Roberts Mountain, west of Mount Hope. This was one of the original Pony Express stations built in the spring of 1860. It's difficult to say whether Bolivar Roberts or Howard Egan built Roberts Creek. Some accounts say Bolivar Roberts and his crew built stations as far east as Roberts Creek. However, Burton said Roberts Creek was the westernmost extent of Egan's division. After May 1860, it's believed the Indians had destroyed the station, but uh, Bolivar Roberts set out to rebuild and restock them. Well, this time the buildings were better constructed and men left to occupy each one until the Indian troubles were over. On June 16th, apparently Bolivar's men met with Howard Egan at the station site. Roberts Creek Station was a telegraph station as well as an overland stage station. It was on an overland stop until 1869. It's now owned by a Filbert Echeverry of Bakersfield. Apparently all the original structures long since been obliterated by the owners. From Roberts Creek Station, we traveled southwest to Grubbs Well, passing through Kobe Valley, north of Lone Mountain. Well, in July 1861, John Butterfield began his overland stage service. He ran his service uh, fairly closely along the Pony Express route, but he built some additional stations along the route. Grubbs Well may have been one of those. In 1861, though, the station was a TP-like structure with rough poles covered by rushes and grass. It was fresh milk from a rare milk cow kept by the hostler. The well here was only 10 feet deep and was open to anyone who would haul the harshly alkaline water. There are no original buildings here at Grubbs Well Station. 
Don Smith of Battle Mountain is the owner of the patented land on which the structures are located. Just southwest of the site sits a rock and concrete monument bearing a, another brass centennial Pony Express marker. Well, leaving Grubbs Well, we past Bean Flat to the south and along the eastern flank of the Simpson Park Mountains, we arrive at Dry Creek Station. Sources generally agree on the identity and use of this station by the Pony Express during its entire existence. And under Bolivar Roberts probably established Dry Creek in the spring of 1860. Like other stations, uh, it experienced Indian troubles in May of 1860. Indians killed Ralph Rosier, the station keeper, and badly wounded his partner, John Applegate, who soon thereafter committed suicide. Two other men escaped to the next station. Well, on October 11, 1860, Richard Burton visited the station and he noted the grave of Rosier and Applegate and identified the station keeper as one Colonel Tutton. The Transcontinental Telegraph was rapidly being constructed in 1861. As fast as stations were established, news of the day was sent to them by wire and transferred to the Pony Express. This meant that, as far as telegraphic communications were concerned, the Pony Express was playing a constantly lessening role. Newspapers told of the progress of the telegraph across the country. The San Francisco Bulletin of August 13, 1861 said the Pony Express rider was leaving his dispatches for the Bulletin and other Pacific Coast newspapers at Dry Creek Station. Well, Dry Creek was used by the Overland Stage and Mail Company as a way stop from 1861 to 1869. It was from Dry Creek West that the stage route and Pony Express route differed slightly. Pony Express traveled almost directly westward from here to the north of Eagle Butte and on to Simpson Park. The stage went south around Cape Horn and then west. The remains of the Dry Creek Pony Express Station are on Dry Creek Ranch, four miles north of Highway 50. A few rock foundations overgrown with sagebrush mark the mound uh, above the creek where the station was situated. A rock monument bearing a brass commemorative plate distributed as part of the Pony Express Centennial of 1960 sits near the station site. Remnants of the old trail leading over to Eagle Butte along the shortcut are barely visible to the west of the station. Benny Damel says it's called Streep's Cutoff. It's also called Streeper's Cutoff after William Streeper. Remains of the Overland Stage Station, a stone structure sit just off the main gravel road before it turns to go up to the ranch. After rounding Cape Horn, we go north towards Simpson Park Canyon. This is at the northern end of the Toyabe Range. And then on to the Simpson Park Station. This was one of the original Pony Express stations built in the spring of 1860. The area was named for Captain J.H. Simpson. Simpson Park was probably used by the Overland Mail and Stage Line from July of 1861 to 1862 or 1863 when the run was changed to go through Austin. In 1861, William James was hired on the run from here to Cold Springs. At 18, he was one of the best Pony Express riders in the service. He rode only 60 miles each way, 
but covered his round trip of 120 miles in 12 hours, including all stops. He always rode California Mustangs, using five of these animals each way. His route crossed the summits of two mountain ridges, lay through the Shoshone Indian country, and was one of the loneliest and most dangerous divisions on the line. On May 20th, 1860, the day before the attack on Dry Creek Station, Indians raided Simpson Park, killed James Alcott, the station keeper, scattered the livestock, and burned the station. When Richard Burton arrived at Simpson Park on October 13th of 1860, he found an incomplete new station house. Only once in the history of the Pony Express did the mail not go through. Having just completed eight once-a-week trips in both directions, the service was forced to suspend operations due to the outbreak of the Paiute Indian War in May of 1860. Named after station keeper George Washington Jacobs, the station possibly began as the site of one of George Chorpenning's 1859 mail posts near the Reese River. In the summer of 1860, Indians burned the station, and a new incomplete adobe structure was what Richard Burton found when he arrived at October 13th of that same year. The Overland Mail Company and other stage lines also operated a station at the site. This grew into a promising little town of Jacobsville. When the silver boom began in Austin, the Overland shifted its operation to that settlement about uh, 1864. From Reese River, we traveled south towards Immigrant Peak and the Shoshone Mountains, the Dry Well Station, just north of Railroad Pass. Dry Well Station was probably built in the summer of 1861 and not part of the Pony Express system. It was located north of Railroad Pass. There's nothing there today to indicate the station. There are or were some old telegraph poles, but little else. The site's on public land. The Overland Mail Company used the station until about 1862 or 63 when it shifted to a more northerly route, just south of Mount Airy, New Pass, and Edwards Creek. Dry Wells, we traveled west through Smith Creek Valley to Smith Creek Station, east of the Desatoya Mountains. A number of sources identify Smith Creek as a station, including the 1861 Overland Mail contract. John M. Townley lists the site as a home station. Well, on October 14th of 1860, Richard Burton visited Smith Creek and recorded his unusually favorable impressions of the station house and Stone Corral. Two 1860 shootings remain associated with Smith Creek. One involved the station keeper, H. Trumbo, who shot rider Montgomery Mays in the hip after an argument. The second shooting, writer William Carr, 
quarreled with Bernard Chessy at Smith Creek. Carr later killed Chessy and was hanged at Carson City. Cold Spring Station was built in the March 1860 by Superintendent Bolivar Roberts, J.G. Kelly, and others. It was put to use by the Pony Express in early April. Jim McNaughton was the station keeper until he became a rider. J.G. Kelly was assistant station keeper for a while. The 1860 structure was built of large native rocks and mud. It was a large station measuring 116 feet by 51 feet. The walls were four to six feet high and up to three feet thick. And there were four distinct rooms, storage area, barn, corral, and living quarters. The horse corral was located next to the living quarters primarily as a safety measure to guard the valuable animals. May 1860, Indians attacked the station, killed the station keeper, and took the horses. They raided the station again a few weeks later. When Richard Burton reached Cold Springs on October 15th of 1860, he found a roofless, partially built station house. Townley notes that the Overland Mail Company dropped Cold Springs from its route about July of 1861 in favor of a site west of present U.S. 50. This may be the Rock Creek Station just to the south. Well, station keepers and riders were continually changing. Another rider that stayed at Cold Springs was William James. He rode in 1861 between Simpson Park and Cold Springs. Today at Cold Springs there's a substantial fortress. It still stands out on the trail. The living quarters and corral are easily recognized as well as the windows, gun holes, and a fireplace. The rivulet of good water from the neighboring hills that Burton found so refreshing is still running by the old ruins. So we travel around the southern end of the Clan Alpine Mountains and head towards the Middlegate Station. The site location is now unknown, but there are two likely areas for this station. One is at White Rock Springs, about half a mile south of US 50 and about one and a half miles east of Millgate Butte. Another would be anywhere along the four miles between Middlegate and Westgate along an arroyo that often has seeps or short lengths of running water. The meadows between Middlegate and Westgate also would attract an overland station because a lot of native hay ripe after June each year. But after passing Westgate, which Richard Burton noted only as a geographical location rather than a station, my own recollection becomes hazy. I suppose Orion's notes may provide some answers, but they're not available to me presently. The best information I have is that the overland stage veered to the northwest from the Pony Express Trail. Sometime just before I passed through, the Overland Mail Company added a number of stations. Mentioned are such names as Fairview, Mountain Well, Stillwater, Old River, Ragtown, and Desert Wells. This is referred to as the Northern Route, or the Stillwater Dogleg. The Pony Express Trail is reported to have continued due west from Westgate, through Sand Springs, Carson Sink, Hooton Wells, Bucklands, and Fort Churchill. 
I do recall briefly stopping at Ragtown, so we must have taken this northern route, but I have no recollection of descending a precipitous mountain range where the Mountain Well Station is reported to have been located. This occurred before I had developed any habits as a journalist. I was still only a recently unemployed riverboat pilot seeking peaceful adventures away from a terrible war zone. What I do recall of my own journey at this point is, on the 19th day, we crossed the great American desert, 40 memorable miles of bottomless sand into which the coach wheels sunk from six inches to a foot. We worked our passage most of the way across, that is to say, we got out and walked. It was a dreary pull and a long and thirsty one, for we had no water. From one extremity of this desert to the other, the road was white with the bones of oxen and horses. It would hardly be an exaggeration to say that we could have walked the forty miles and set our feet on a bone at every step. The desert was one prodigious graveyard, and the log chains, wagon tires, and rotting wrecks of vehicles were almost as thick as the bones. I think we saw log chains enough rusting there in the desert to reach across any state of the Union. Do not these relics suggest something of an idea of the fearful suffering and privation the early immigrants to California endured? At the border of the desert lies Carson Lake, or the Sink of the Carson, a shallow, melancholy sheet of water some 80 or 100 miles in circumference. Carson River empties into it and is lost sinks mysteriously into the earth and never appears in the light of the sun again, for the lake has no outlet whatever. An army officer arriving in the region just after Ormsby's battle with the Paiutes found a scene of chaos and some panic, with trains of people returning to California to avoid the Indians. Volunteers were armed and mustered. Colonel Jack Hayes, a former Texas Ranger, was given command. They set out from California on June 2nd, 1860. Hayes fought the Paiutes in two skirmishes near Pyramid Lake. Neither was decisive, but the Indians sustained sufficient injuries to destroy Numaga's loosely coordinated command structure. The bands dispersed into the Black Rock and Smoke Creek deserts and the surrounding hills. Some traveled further into Oregon, Idaho, and Washington Territory. The war petered out. U.S. troops built a temporary fort near Pyramid Lake, then moved to the more permanent Fort Churchill, which guarded the wagon trail from the east. This is obviously not the end of hostilities, with some horrendous events still to come, but neither Poito nor Numaga was involved. Poito was born a Shoshone, but he became a Paiute through marriage to old Winnemucca's daughter. He was poisoned in 1882. Nubaga was born sometime around 1830, said by some to be the son of Chief Winnemucca and brother of Sarah Winnemucca. Sarah Winnemucca wrote that he was her cousin. He died of tuberculosis, a white man's disease. 1871. On the 
western verge of the desert, we halted a moment at Ragtown. It consisted of one log house and is not down on the map. Told in 1854, one A.L. Kenyon established a trading post on his ranch at Ragtown. It's on the path of the California Trail. He dug a well 11 miles to the north and is credited with saving the lives of many immigrants coming across the 40-mile desert. This would place the well presumably on or near the California Trail somewhere near the Upsall Hogback. Temporary pole and canvas dwellings and stores were thrown up on this site in the late 1850s to take advantage of this immigrant traffic. But like other stations on the Stillwater Dogleg, Ragtown probably functioned briefly as a Pony Express station in the summer and fall of 1861 and as an overland mail company stage stop from 1861 to 1868. Kenyon and his family managed station operations at the site for nearly 50 years. In 1862, Ragtown experienced a flood which disturbed many of the immigrant graves. In 1863, Ragtown became an important stop on the road to the Reese River mining area. But with the arrival of the Central Pacific Railroad, its importance diminished somewhat. The post office finally opened in 1864, only to close in 1867. In his 1881 history, Myron Angel gave a reconstruction of Numaga's speech that may reveal as much about Angel as it does about Numaga. You could make war upon the whites. I ask you to pause and reflect. The white men are like the stars over your heads. You have wrongs, great wrongs, that rise up like those mountains before you. But can you, from the mountain tops? reach and blot out those stars. Your enemies are like the sands in the bed of your rivers. When taken away, they only give place for more to come and settle there. Could you defeat the whites in Nevada from over the mountains in California would come to help them an army of white men that would cover your country like a blanket. What hope is there for the Paiute? From where's to come your guns, your powder, your lead, your dried meats to live upon, and hay to feed your ponies with while you carry on this war? Your enemies have all of these things, more than they can use. They will come like the sand in a whirlwind and drive you from your homes. You will be forced among the barren rocks of the earth, where your ponies will die where you will see the women and old men starve and listen to the cries of your children for food. I love my people, let them live. When their spirit shall be called to the great camp in the southern sky, let their bones rest where their fathers were buried. We were approaching the end of our long journey was the morning of the 20th day. At noon we would reach Carson City, capital of Nevada Territory. We were not glad but sorry. It had been a fine pleasure trip. We had fed fat on wonders every day. We were now well accustomed to stage life and very fond of it. So the idea of coming to a standstill and settling down to a humdrum existence in a village was not agreeable, but on the contrary, depressing. Visibly, our new home was a desert walled in by barren, snow-clad mountains. There was not a tree in sight, there was no vegetation, but the endless sagebrush and greasewood. All nature was gray with it. 
We were plowing through great deeps of powdery alkali dust that rose in thick clouds and floated across the plain like smoke from our burning house. We were coated with it like millers. So were the coach, the mules, the mailbags, the driver, we and the sagebrush and the other scenery were all one monotonous color. Long trains of freight wagons in the distance enveloped in ascending masses of dust suggested pictures of prairies on fire. These teams and their masters were the only life we saw. Otherwise, we moved in the midst of solitude, silence, and desolation. Every twenty steps we passed a skeleton of some dead beast of burden, with its dust-coated skin stretched tightly over its empty ribs. Frequently, a solemn raven sat upon the skull or the hips and contemplated the passing coach with meditative serenity. By and by, Carson City was pointed out to us. It nestled in the edge of a great plain and was a sufficient number of miles away to look like an assemblage of mere white spots in the shadow of a grim range of mountains overlooking it, whose summit seemed lifted clear out of companionship and consciousness of earthly things. We arrived, disembarked, and the stage went on. It was a wooden town, its population 2,000 souls. The main street consisted of four or five blocks of little white frame stores, which were too high to sit upon, but not too high for various other purposes. In fact, hardly high enough. <laughs>